Hi, everybody. With our Happy Mind Story series, I share the inspirational stories of people who have suffered with mental health and have successfully learned to live with this and go on to thrive and are now helping others to do the same. In today's Happy Mind Story, I have the pleasure of speaking with Michael Anthony, also known as Michael Unbroken, who will be sharing his amazing story as a survivor of childhood abuse and trauma. Michael is an advocate for adult survivors of child abuse and childhood trauma, international speaker and author. He's been called the Tony Robbins of trauma and spends his time helping other survivors get out of the vortex to become the hero of their own story and take their life back. Michael hosts both the Michael Unbroken and Think Unbroken podcast and blogs weekly at www.thinkunbroken.com. He's the author of the number one best-selling book, Think Unbroken, Understanding and Overcoming Childhood Trauma, and Think Unbroken, Eight Steps to Healing Your Inner Child. Michael, thank you so much for taking part. So how are you going today? Yeah, man. Thanks for having me. I'm super excited to be here with you, and uh, it's, it's an honor, brother. Awesome. So, well, let's get started. Perhaps you can uh, introduce yourself to the audience. Uh, I've given a bit of an intro, but go a little bit more personally, and then also talk a little bit about the story that's taken you to where you are now at Think Unbroken. Yeah, for sure. And, uh, you know, I'll hit you with the bullet points and as deep as you want to go, we'll go. Um, I always create a little bit of a preface first. Um, you know, please don't compare your story to mine. You know, we we live completely different lives, different environments, different circumstances. And and a lot of times people go, well, my story's not as bad as his. And I'm like, doesn't matter. So when when I was four years old, my mother, who was a drug addict and alcoholic, um, actually cut off my right index finger, you see multiple surgeries, multiple skin grafts. Um, my stepfather, who she married when I was six, was super abusive. The kind of guy you pray is never your stepfather. You know, he's six foot four, 220, beating up a seven-year-old, putting me in the hospital, abusing my brothers and I. And, you know, from eight to 12, we, we were severely in poverty and even homeless at periods of time. And I lived with over 30 different families in that window, getting bounced around place to place to place, strangers, friends of family, family members. Sometimes we slept in vans. Like I, I never really knew where we were going to end up. And when I was 12, after living in an abandoned house for six weeks by myself, going to steal food from the store on the corner of 30th and Georgetown in Indianapolis, my grandmother came and found me. She ended up adopting me. And, you know, in some sense, that's a godsend, uh, except I'm biracial, black and white. And she was an old racist white lady from a town in Tennessee you never heard of. So, you know, just imagine the identity crisis that comes with that. And so at 12 years old, like any 12 year old child, I started getting high every day, smoking weed, popping pills. By 13, I was getting drunk. And by 15, I got kicked out of school for selling drugs. And so I'm breaking in houses, stealing cars, running from cops, getting shot at, fighting people. I mean, it was some movie shit, man. It was crazy. And end up not graduating high school, get kicked out. I find a solution to poverty, at least what I thought at the time in my mind was money. And so I made a declaration when I was 18, I was going to go make $100,000 a year legally. And the legal part was very important because I have family in prison for life. I've been in handcuffs more times than I can count. And my three childhood best friends have been murdered. And so, man, it's like I knew where I was going. And like anyone who discovers money at a young age, I would soon come to find that it doesn't solve your problems. And by 26, I'd made almost a million dollars working for a Fortune 10 company, no high school diploma, no college education. And I was 350 pounds, smoking two packs of cigarettes a day, drinking myself to sleep. I was high all day long, cheating on my girlfriend. $50,000 in debt. My car got repoed. My little brother tells me, never talk to me again. You're not my brother. And I attempted suicide for the second time. And in the moment, you know, one of the things that happened that really transformed everything for me is I was laying in bed. It's like 11 o'clock in the morning. The next day I'm eating chocolate cake and watching the CrossFit games. <laughs> Like, dude, I'm this like in this massive rock bottom moment. And I picked myself up. I went and looked at myself in the mirror in the bathroom. 
And I remember being eight years old and the water company had come and turned our water off. Now imagine this, we were so poor and so impoverished that at eight years old, growing up in America, that they turned our water off. And that day my mom said, go across the street to the neighbor's house and get water, but do not tell them, do not knock on the door. And so for the first time in my life, I stole water. Would not be the last time. And I remember being like, when I'm a grown up, this will not be my life. And so on paper, it wouldn't look that way. I'm dating a smoking hot girl and I have the best condo and I have all this money and all these clothes and all these friends and all this bullshit. And as I was looking at myself in the mirror, I realized I was breaking that promise I had made to that eight-year-old version of me. And I asked myself a question. It's like, what are you willing to do to have the life that you want to have? The answer was no excuses, just results. And almost 13 years later, man, here I am talking to you. Awesome. An incredible story. So well, now let's talk about what exactly is childhood trauma and, and how can it kind of like manifest itself later on for adults? Because this is the area you kind of like work with. I mean, you know, I think there's some statistics I've seen you kind of like speak about as far as childhood trauma and it's quite quite astronomical there's a large percentage of us who've kind of like had that experience and this is kind of like impacting us later in life so maybe you can talk a little bit about that yeah i mean that's the most important thing like i'm super analytical right and so when when i got deep into my own healing journey from like 26 to 30 I was like constantly just researching, trying to understand, bringing in all the information and data because I was trying to like figure out why these things kept happening to me. Why would I get successful and lose it? Why would I have a great relationship and then cheat? Why would I make money and then be in debt? You know, and I was like trying to really understand this stuff. And so I, I first let me define, and this is my opinion of what trauma is. It, it's not the experience that happens right? Scars heal, wounds close. It's the continuation of the impact of that negatively implementing itself into your life daily. It's when you're walking down the street and you smell something and you get triggered or you hear a door close and you get thrown into a hypervigilant state or every single time you're in conflict with someone, you shut down and all of that being based on those experiences of the past, which were ultimately transferred into survival mechanisms. You know, we have these autonomic responses to stressors based upon our developmental years that help us stay safe, right? And so it's like, you look at the the fact that when trauma is in your own house, most kids who grew up in households like me, who you know don't have the opportunity to ever be in rest, to ever be able to recover, to they're always in fight or flight. And when I started doing this research, I started being like, man, this makes a lot of sense. I see why this is happening in my life. So initially, I came across this study called the Adverse Childhood Experiences Study. This was done by Dr. Folletti, the Kaiser Permanente, and the California Center for Disease Control. I will say this. I respect the shit out of this study. I think it's great. It's not deep enough. I feel like there's still depths that we need to go. But it was it was based around 10 questions and trying to figure out whether or not your childhood experiences would actually turn into long-term detrimental health ramifications. Like unequivocally, the data all port points to yes. And so those questions are, I'll just give you a couple of them. When you were a child, did you ever not feel taken care of, loved, or supported? When you were a child, did one of your parents have suicidal ideations or commit suicide or have a mental health disorder? When you were a child, did one of your parents get divorced? When you were a child, um, was anyone in your family imprisoned or, or put into jail? When you were a child, were you ever hit physically? When you were a child, were you ever touched sexually inappropriately, right? And then a handful of other questions. So depending on where you answer yes to these questions, you start to see the this really interesting picture get painted in front of you. So the answer to those questions for me, I answered yes to all 10 of them. And so the majority of people I work with, they don't ever see that. Thank God. I'm really glad they don't have that experience. 
However, statistically, especially in the world we live in today, most people are going to answer yes to one of those questions. The vast majority. Typically, you see with divorce rates of 65% in America, you're probably going to have a parent who was divorced, right? And so automatically, that's considered a child adverse childhood experience, which makes sense because you lose the parental bond and connection. And depending on how you look at love as a child, it kind of skews your reality, right? Well, if you answered yes to one, there's an 83% chance that you answered yes to two or more, right? So think about that. If you had one experience, you're probably going to have two or more. If you get to four or more, which is my case scenario and many of the people I've coached over the years, depending on where you fall on the spectrum and how much resiliency and support you had as a child, you could be up to 5,200% more likely to commit suicide. You can be 2,200% more likely to use tobacco products and 2,000% more likely to be an alcoholic versus someone who answered no to those questions. Not to mention the exacerbated increased potential of heart attacks, pulmonary embolisms, heart attacks, diabetes, cancer, and dementia, right? And so you're like, so you mean to tell me that my past is indicative of my future? The answer is yes, but... There is the process and journey of healing. There is stepping into this process of learning to love yourself, of overcoming, of putting things on the shelf of where they need to be, of having people like me who coach and mentor and write books and speak on stages and all those things become a, a, a mechanism for you to go down this journey. And so, you know, I look at that. If you if you look at my life at 25, that rock bottom scenario, the picture I just painted you, I was living exactly into what the research said I would be, Right. It's crazy when I really connect those dots. And so what I always tell people, if you're going through and you're looking at this data and this information and you're like, man, this really is kind of like my experience, that's a telltale sign of your future. You show me your past, I'll show you your future unless you create an intervention. And, and my hope is, and the reason I created Think Unbroken, the reason I do things like this with you today, Damien, is because my hope is that we have an intervention for people that will create a space in which they can go down the path of healing and not have to let their past be the thing that dictates their future. No, very good. <clears throat> I guess the point you're kind of also making is a lot of people have gone through these experiences and then... You know, they've assumed it's not impacting them, but the reality is it is impacting them. And then they need to address it if they really kind of like want to kind of like move forward and like be all they can kind of be. So perhaps we could talk about some of the things um, that could be manifesting. You kind of like indicated a few. You may be struggling with relationships. That could be one indication you may get, have moments of success and then basically you kind of like self-sabotage yourself again. So what are some of the other things that could happen as a result of past traumas? Yeah, I mean, and and look, I, I think like as humans, I don't want to paint this picture that like this doesn't happen to everybody because look, man, we're here. We're going to screw up. We're going to do dumb shit. We're going to make poor decisions. We're going to be out of alignment with our values and our character, our integrity and our mission. And, and I think so much of it is like recognizing that the cornerstone to all of this is like know thyself. Right. And, and I think we lived in a society of, of learned helplessness of learned victimhood where, and look, here's what I will say about this. Cause I think it's really important. I do not want to take the ability for anyone to play the victim away from them. I don't want to do that. You have every right in the world to, right. But if you choose to go that path, like don't complain because that's the path you're choosing. And that's a hard thing for people to hear. Like I have suffered in ways people don't even understand. And so have many of the people that I've worked with, and I've seen them come through the other side by having the willingness to face the darkness. And one of the things I think about all the time is when you face darkness and you bring it to light, it loses its power over you. 
and you cannot heal what is not revealed, right? You hear people say this all the time. And so when I stand on this platform in these stages and I write book and I'm talking about, I was molested, I was beaten, I was locked in closets, I was starved, I'm covered in scars and cuts and burns. I wasn't taken to the hospital when I was injured. I was homeless. I stole food to survive. I had a learning disability. I didn't graduate high school. My three childhood best friends got murdered. It's like, I get it, dude. Like, I get it. I know how Im incredible it can feel to be in victimhood and to blame the world. And I know what happens on the other side of facing it. And so if you're looking at your life constantly and you're like, how do I get in these same relationships? How do I have these same conversations with family? How is it that I'm in debt again? How did I get fired from another job? Why do I have these anger issues? Why do I keep getting pulled over by the police for driving too fast? It's like, Who's the common denominator in all of this? And I think that a big part of this journey is recognizing your personal responsibility to go on your own healing journey. And you look, you're not culpable for the bad things that happened to you. It's not my fault. It's not my fault that these terrible things happened. It's not your fault that bad things happened to you, especially as children, man, like shit happens. Life is fucking hard, but like make a decision today. Who do you want to be? Because if you're okay with the life that you have and continuing to have bad relationships and be in debt and be morbidly obese and not love yourself, then you're going to die with regret. And that's just the way that this game works. But if you're willing to like raise your hand and be like, I need help, your life will be very different, man. And look, and I'll tell you this, I, I know what it's like because people will come to me and they'll be like, man, I don't know what to do. I'm at rock bottom. I don't have any money. I don't have a support system. I'm like, Preaching to the choir, I've been there, but you have to be willing to do whatever it takes. I mean, you can go back to a post I made on, in, on Facebook in 2015, 2015. So we're talking about almost eight years ago. And I said, hey, can someone loan me $150 so I can go to therapy this week? Publicly, I did this because I was so willing to look at this and just face the truth that I needed help. And I was willing to put my ego aside. I was willing to put aside people's judgment of me and be like, fuck it. I need help. I need that. I will eat ramen noodles for the next three years if it means that I can go down this path. And that's what I did. And so it, that's what it really comes down to, man. If you're looking at your life and you're constantly repeating the same behavioral patterns, it's like, when are you going to acknowledge reality? People are always asking me, how do you start the process? How do you heal? I'm like, tell the truth. Stop lying. Like, when are you going to stop lying? You're not okay. Your wife doesn't talk to you. You got fired again. Your kids can't stand you. You're in poor health. You're smoking and drinking every single day. You're, you're in this horribly dire situation and you won't tell the truth. Well, your life's not going to be different until you do. Very powerful. So yeah, no, you you need to make a choice. So once you've made that choice, what are the next steps then? Because I guess the hardest thing for most people is making that first step, which is acknowledging, as you said, that they, <clears throat> whilst they're not responsible for what had happened to them, they are responsible for their life. So once I've made that decision that I am responsible what what's the next steps they need to make so how do you you're at rock bottom you kind of acknowledge that all these things that are happening to you uh because of these past things that have happened so how do you kind of like face these things how do you kind of like shine them in the light like you're saying like uh, unless you kind of like reveal them that you're not going to heal from them yeah well you know here's the best part about rock bottom man you can't go any lower <laughs> <laughs> you know so it's like, shit, I'm at rock bottom. Life is really bad. Good, good. Now you know what you don't want. You know, now you know what you don't want. And then from there, it's really about like the process of the, the showing up. And in the showing up, it's like, cool, can you go ask for help? Can you, and look, let's say you're in my situation where I was 50 grand in debt. Dude, I had no money, no, zero. I had less than zero. I had negative 50,000, right? But there was a, a course that I saw online with a guy called Brendan Burchard and it was 49 bucks. And I was like, screw it. 
I'm already 50 grand in debt. What's another $50? And I just started investing in myself. And, and it was not only that, like that wasn't like the, that was a, a, a marker for me that proved to me that I could start to like do something for myself that was healthy. Right. And so it was doing that. And then it was, I'm going to go to therapy. I'm going to find a therapist and I'm going to be honest with this therapist. And then I'm going to get a coach. But before then, because I don't have any money, I'm going to read all the books and I'm going to go to all of the events that I can go to. And I'm going to just surround myself with positive, positive people. I'm going to change my environment. I'm going to change my physical state. I quit smoking, quit drinking, started working out, um, started doing yoga, meditating, journaling. Um, and then it was just kind of like this waterfall of just trying all these different things. I don't think any one modality solves the problem for people. Like, to be honest with you, I, I think it's a journey of you just have to constantly be testing. It's an iterative process. It's kind of like doing a, you have a hypothesis, right? You're like, I think I can heal myself. I think I can love myself, but I cannot do it alone, right? I don't believe you can do this alone. I truly don't. I will stand on that all day long. And so like, I have this hypothesis. I think I can heal myself, but I know I can't do it alone. So where do I start? Well, you don't start with your friends and you don't start with your husband or your wife and you don't start with your employees or your business partner. You start with people who are trained professionals who can help you. And look, and here's the reality. Maybe you can't afford Tony Robbins, right? Tony Robbins is like insane amount of money to work with, right? And maybe you can't afford me because I'm in the middle. And maybe you can't afford somebody who's put together an event like this. And it's whatever this event costs. And it's like, find a way to make it happen. And I think that's the biggest thing that people have to leverage. And knowing that no one single thing is going to solve all of your problems. You know, that one course I did with Brendan didn't change my life, except in one way. It was like, well, I can still push forward even when I'm at rock bottom. And when I was in therapy, I had to go through like 10 therapists before I found the person that really helped me. And then with coaches, I've worked with some of the greatest minds in the world, but I've filtered and circled through them trying to find the right connections. And, and I think the biggest thing is people want the one, two, three, but it's not one, two, three, it's one to a hundred. And then it's rinse and repeat and do it again every single day for the rest of your life until you die. And, and that becomes this space of like, not only just radical responsibility and acknowledgement, but giving yourself permission to succeed. Like I, this really, like truly, if I were to like button all this up and I put something around it as a starting point, it's just belief. Like you have to believe that you're capable of doing this thing in front of you because it's hard, dude, it's the hardest thing I've ever done. Showing up every single day, living my life, being the hero of my own story, like creating the reality I want to be in, not being a victim, not living in learned helplessness. It's a daily effort. Damien, there's nothing I'd rather be doing right now than getting stoned, playing video games and eating pizza, right? But it's like, how does that make my life better? And it doesn't. And so it's about showing up and dealing with the discomfort of becoming the person that you're capable of being. And, you know, I always tell my clients, like, if you want to grow, you have to suffer and suffer. If you look up the definition means to be in discomfort. And sometimes being in discomfort means changing everything about yourself to become the person you're capable of being. No, very true. <clears throat> so it sounds like you need to have a vision of where you want to go because without that vision and, and also a belief, you're not able to go through all those steps. And then, as you said, there's no magic pill. It's going to be different for everyone else. And you need to go off and explore and be willing to kind of explore and then not look for magic remedies. Um, but then along the way, look for guides, people who can kind of steer you in the right direction and give you the tools and strategies that may help you. But it won't be one person, it may be multiple people, um, but you have to keep on looking and use and then view it as a lifelong journey as opposed to, I do it for a short period of time, magically I'm healed, I can address everything that happened to me, and then my life is suddenly going to be perfect. Um, unfortunately, that isn't reality. So... 
so so basically you just have to view it as a lifelong quest and then along the way kind of work, find out what works for you so for yourself what have been some of the key tools and strategies that you've worked and then i know when you're sharing these these are not to say this is going to work for everyone else but just to give people a perspective on some of the things that have kind of like resonated with you so at least they have some starting points in their own journey yeah you know i when i made that declaration about no excuses just results like i meant that in a lot of ways and one of the ways that it meant was just in the experimentation of discovery and so I've done every, almost every modality you can imagine, man. Well, I've done CBT, EMDR, NLP, ABC. Like I've done all the things, right? I've done I've done plant medicine ceremonies. I've done meditation retreats. I've done or, or meditation sessions. I've done like ice baths and cold baths. I've done physical therapy, Reiki, um, inner child work, family systems work. I've done like, I mean, literally I could just keep going. Like, it's insane. I wrote it all down one day and it was like 90 <clears throat> different things that I've tried and some things worked really well. And some things I did not resonate with in any way. And I was like, this is stupid. Right. And so, but that's the game and it's going to be different for everybody. One of the most important things that I did though, was I built a community around me. Right. And so that's one of the things we do with Think Unbroken. We have a community who meets every single week and we share and we go through coaching session and we talk about where our lives are. People feel like they're alone in this. And I did too. Like I really felt alone in this. I was like, man, why does God hate me? Why am I always like in these terrible situations? Like I don't get it. Like this is so unfair. And I put myself into a men's trauma therapy coaching group. And man, it changed my life forever because I was willing to go into a space of community with other human beings who had been through some dark things. And I realized I wasn't by myself. And that was the greatest thing ever, man. Really, it truly was. And so that's why I created a group program myself. And so when, when I advise people about really those first steps and what they should consider doing, so much of it truly lies in the idea that it's like, go be with other humans. Stop being isolated. Stop being by yourself. Like, it's like, I heard one of my mentors tell me this one time. He was like, you think you're having a bad day? Go to a soup kitchen. Go to the abuse shelter. Go to the animal clinic. Go be of service to people. And he said something to me that was just so fat. He's like, if you're depressed, it's because you're being selfish. And I was like, well, I don't know about that entirely, but I get the concept, right? And it's like, go and be a part of the human experience on your hardest days. And that was that was one of the most important things that I did. Also found a tremendous amount of value in just my physical fitness, stepping deeper into movement. And so in the beginning, a lot of that was in yoga, right? Because I was 350 pounds, I couldn't work out or run. Like I was so fat, I couldn't do anything. But doing yoga, which eventually turned into hot yoga was both meditative, um, and very healing for my physical body. And then from there, it turned into I did end up doing CrossFit and still do for years and years and years, I went deeper into my martial arts practice. So physical movement was a big part of it. And then the other thing was just being introspective, like really sitting with myself, in boredom, a lot of times, to be honest, and just thinking about life, making meaning of it, getting in my journal, meditating, and, and just trying to understand at a deeper level who I am. And so again, I don't think there's any one solution. You just got to try a bunch of things and find what works and then do it until it doesn't work anymore and then find something else. No, I like it. So in summary, what would you say this whole journey and experience has kind of like taught you about yourself? Well, I think that it, that here it's funny because I was just being interviewed by somebody a few minutes ago before I got on here with you and they had asked me like the same question. And, and I think the answer is very much the same thing. And it's like, I realized that it was loving myself that has led me down this path and believing it was possible. You know, the, the only wish that someone in the desert has is hope, you know, maybe I'll find the water, maybe it'll be out here. And that's all I ever did, man. I just was like, man, maybe I can do this. Maybe I can heal. Like I look full transparency. I didn't sign up for this job 
dude, I did not want to be the trauma guy. I didn't ask to be on billboards in New York. I didn't ask to sell these books, blah, blah, blah. But it was like, man, if I can just show people what's possible, because when I look at me at 25 years old versus me at 38 years old, there are two different human beings having two different human experiences now. One was of the lack of love, of fear, of, of all the negativity vibrating at a very low energy and frequency. And where I am today, it's like those experiences are not removed from me. It's not that magically I don't have the experience of a lot of the things that I've done in my life, but I vibrate in love and honesty and truth and kindness. And I try to lead first and share my vulnerabilities. And I, I show up every single day as this version of me. And so the greatest thing that I've learned is just that it's possible. Cause look, man, I know I, I, I do hate when people say this and I like, don't even love that I'm about to say it, but it's like, man, if I could do this, you can too. Like I was set up for massive failure, massive. There's almost no fucking way I should be here with you right now. It's almost impossible. And yet here I am. Why? Because I made decisions every day that put me in discomfort, that created growth while having a community and having a support system that guided me in a direction based on the hope and the idea that maybe one day I could be. No, very powerful message. And so you know, I, I guess if people kind of like really kind of like invest in themselves and kind of like believe in themselves, anything's kind of like possible, isn't it, regardless of where you are. So, you know, what kind of like other points would you like to make about the, the journey and the growth that you can possibly achieve if you're willing to kind of like, you know, believe in yourself? Yeah, look, man, you just got to be patient. I'm 13 years into this journey, dude. I still have a coach. I still have a therapist. I still read the books. I still go to the conference. I'm still learning. Dude, it is crazy to me. Like sometimes I'm learning shit and I'm like, why didn't I learn this when I was like 13? Why did nobody teach me this? And so I think people need to be patient. Um, patience is not a virtue. I think patience is a skill. And you have to learn how to acquire that skill because it's going to carry a lot of weight in your future. In addition to that, I think that you have to have grace for yourself uh, because you're going to fuck up and you're going to do dumb things and you are going to live outside of your values, even though you did all the work. Everyone does because guess what? You're human and you ain't perfect. So you might as well stop pretending you are. And then, so if you have patience and grace, the last thing that you need is kindness for yourself first. And it's like, man, some people are saying things to themselves that are so mean. It's like, if you said that to me on the street, I would fight you. And it's like, you think you're going to be successful talking to yourself like that. Okay. Good luck with that. So I think it's patience, grace, and kindness, man. No, awesome tips. So what would you say to your younger self? Like, say, now, 38, looking back, what would you tell yourself at age 13 or younger? Nothing. Because one, I wouldn't be here. And two, I wouldn't listen. I'd be like, get out of my face, old man. You know what I'm saying? (laughs) And so it's like... It's like, man, you can't, you know, and I get the question. I appreciate it. I, I I know why you're asking the question, but I know me for sure. I'd have been like, get out of my face. You don't know anything. Right. And so if I were, let me put on the other hat, the, the answer that I would give knowing that the reason why you asked the question is I would probably tell that 13 year old version of myself to don't quit. That's it. Just don't quit because you can't lose if you don't give up. It's impossible. This is an infinite game. And so I think about like my goals, my dreams, my ambitions, my relationships, my friendships, my career, my health. It's like, dude, until the day I die, I am not quitting. I don't care how hard this gets. Very good. What would you say we could do to help people say like yourself when you're like 13 like i know the as you said 13 year olds are kind of like rebellious they don't want to kind of like listen to anyone else but 
what could we do to kind of give them hope earlier on you know if they're going through these traumas they've had a hard upbringing they've experienced things in life that are definitely going to shape them well how can we ensure or give them a possibility of influence them in a more positive way so that they can hopefully make better decisions as you said like you had two paths fortunately you chose a path that potentially could have like ended up with you ending your life earlier than you needed to and then now you're on this particular journey so you know it's almost like a flip of a coin for a kid at Mm -hmm. that age so how do we somehow help them see there is a possibility beyond where they're at at this particular point of time yeah you know i think i think children need certainty i think they need to have people they can trust um i think they need people who can actually show up like you know people talk a big game and they don't show up you know i think kids need to see what's possible you know i I wish somebody one of i do reflect on this a lot actually it would have been really interesting had somebody taken me to a nice neighborhood one day, right? I, I remember the first time I ever saw like a really nice house. I was like, that's a thing. You know what I mean? Like show kids possibility. Cause there are, I'm not an anomaly here, man. I might be an outlier, but I'm not an anomaly. There are a lot of kids who have turned into adults like me and like you who have been able to navigate the world and see the other side of it. And I think it's our responsibility as adults to take that information and that data and just present it to them. Because you're not going to force a kid to do anything they don't want to do. And we keep lying to children all the time. It's like, bro, every kid in America has got a cell phone. And, and you think saying the word fuck is bad for them? Are you kidding me right now? Like, let's stop lying to them. I mean, it's crazy to me. And so it's like, okay, cool. How do you how do you not lie to them? How do you instill trust? How do you show up? And and how do you show them possibility? Because they're gonna have to make their own. Dude, when you were 13, you were a monster. You know what I mean? You even if you were in a, a good situation or a bad situation, you're 13 years old. You think you know everything. You know nothing. You're a complete moron. But it's like if you can if you can stand in front of that kid and just say. I'm not telling you what to do. I'm just here to listen. Eventually they will ask you how to help. No, a very good point there. Um, so now for adults who have gone through the experience, they're now kind of kind of realizing that it's had a negative impact. What advice would you like to give them? Yeah, just go back and watch everything we just talked about for the last 40 minutes, right? Like, like for real, people will consume information once and it's like, yeah, but you didn't get it. The The seeds only just been planted. That's why same thing in the, in, in the first book, I said, when you finish writing this, reading this book, go read it again and then read it again and then read it again and then read it again. Um, because it, it's so much about repetition that creates a, a change in people's lives. It's building muscle effectively, right? And so I would say to anyone who is really taking this journey seriously, it's like you will never do anything one time and have success. It's impossible. I mean, I've, I look at this concept, John Maxwell wrote a book called Failing Forward. And it's like every single day, you just got to be willing to fail, fall down. And then pick yourself back up and keep going. And a lot of the days are going to suck, like really, especially at the beginning. And then they will suck less and then they will suck less. And then instead of days sucking, like it's moments. And if you can get to that, life is very, very cool. Awesome. So what's a final message of hope you would like to leave the audience with? Yeah, look, man, I think at the end of the day, it's like, Here's the hard part about doing these things, Damien, and I I speak on stages around the world. I know that only 9% of people in this room are going to do something with this. And and it's heartbreaking. And I wish it were 100, right? I think that's always the goal, right? And people will come to these things and they'll pay the money and they'll go to the event and blah, blah, blah. And then they will go home and they will do nothing. And the only advice that I truly have for anyone ever is take action. Do something different today than you did yesterday. 
You do something different today and tomorrow and every single day in a year, that's 365 different things that you've done. And you cannot tell me your life will not be different if you take 365 actions. Awesome. So now let's uh, finish up and talk a little bit about the work you're currently doing and um, what Think Unbroken is all about. And um, so the audience has a perspective on what it is, um, you know, you do. Yeah. I mean, we, we do coaching and mentorship. We have the podcast, Think Unbroken podcast, the books, the speaking on stage, the whole nine. Dude, at the end of the day, it's very simple. I just want to bring information to people and make it accessible. And the the ultimate dream is, is very simple. It's like, can I end generational trauma in my lifetime through education and information? That's it. That's all I want to do is just show people what's possible. Awesome. Well, Michael, thank you so much. Um, certainly enjoyed your story. I'm sure the audience has as well. Um, you certainly kind of helped us in our kind of like mission to kind of like destigmatize any kind of mental illness and help people realize that there is a light at the end of the tunnel. And certainly if you want to, you can, you know, start with a basis of hope and then take action. As you said, you can kind of like come out the other end a lot better for it. Um, but I think an important message to kind of reiterate, which you kind of like emphasize is this is a lifelong journey, isn't it? It's not a kind of like a one-time fixes it all. You got to keep on working on this. So for others who are interested in learning more about you, how can I find you online? Yeah, man, I'm everywhere at Michael Unbroken um, on all the platforms. You can message me anytime. I'm actually the only person that checks my social media. My team does not do that. It's just me. Um, and of course, you can listen to the Think Unbroken podcast. If you go to thinkunbrokenpodcast.com, uh, the books are everywhere. They're at the library. They're free. So whatever. Michael, once again, thank you very much for sharing your happy mind story. Yeah, man, my honor. Thank you, brother. 